Hi, everybody. It is my pleasure to welcome to the record player a man who's been a huge part of the Canadian music scene for over three decades. He's been a member of bands such as uh, Look People, Rio Statics, uh, Thin Buckle, The Cousins, as well as having a very long solo career. Uh, we, of course, know him best as songwriter, keyboard player, and guitarist and vocalist for the Grammy nominated band and our very own Bare Naked Ladies. Welcome to the record player, Mr. Kevin Hearn. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Scott. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing okay. It's a nice sunny day, and that's uh, that's nice these days. It is. It's different. Um, how have you been during the pandemic? Um, what do you do with your days? How do you spend your days when you can't really do much of anything else? You know, I find little routines have been, you know, helping me keep balance. Um, going for a bike ride once a day or a long walk, um, meditating for 20 minutes in the morning. You know, I have my first record of the day where I, you know, maybe light a bit of sage and uh, enjoy some music and a cup of tea. Just little rituals that are kind of helping me um, feel balanced. That's awesome. Are you gonna have a hard time going back to things once you can, once you get out of that those rituals? <laughs> I think so. You know, I don't. It's gonna be so strange to walk out on a stage again and mm -hmm. be in front of a large group of people. Uh, but I, I think the energy is going to be fantastic. And I must say, you know, I'm not missing the traveling so much, you know, being on an airplane all the time. And yeah. uh, it's been nice to, uh, you know, have little projects, whether they're creative or not, like, especially I'm cooking a lot more than I, that's, awesome. <laughs> so, that's been cool. I think a lot of people, um, you know, make jokes about getting away from their family. <laughs> They're stuck in a house with their family, but I think a lot of us enjoy being, you know, the, the extra time that we've gotten to spend. So. Sure. Um, the first time I saw you perform um, with anyone at all was probably in the early 90s. I think it was 92, 93. Um, much Music, Daytona Beach with the Look People. <laughs> you were there? I wasn't there. Oh, okay. I, I, th I, I wish I was, um, but like every other kid in the world watching it on TV, um, James B, of course, for anybody who doesn't remember the look people, James B was quite the character. He was a different breed of cat, that guy. Um, look, people weren't around. I think they were, you were with the band, I think for six, seven years, I believe. Eight years. Eight years. Um, they, on that, sorry, go ahead. I'll cover. There. <laughs> James B. And he went on to do some uh, some stuff. I think he hosted a show on CBC. Or no, you guys did that were the musical. Uh, uh, yeah, we were the we were the pit band on the Ralph Ben Murgy show. Right, that's it. On the second season, and James is now a DJ on uh, Jazz FM. Yeah. He has a, he has a new show called Jazz Gone Wild, and it's <laughs> it's kind of cool. That's right. He was he was different for sure. Um, look, people were kind of a. Um, if you were a Frank Zappa fan, I would assume that you'd be a Look People fan. Yeah, we were all, all often compared to uh, Frank Zappa meets Dr. Seuss meets <laughs> King Crimson. <laughs> oh, it was different. And, uh, <laughs> we rehearsed a lot. Um, we rehearsed initially in Clay Tyson's basement. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the son of Ian and Sylvia Tyson. And we rehearsed a lot. I remember Clay saying, if we're going to be a band, I want to be known as the tightest band in Toronto. <laughs> and we worked hard and our arrangements, listening back to them, because I've been going through the old tapes and putting them into um, digital format so they don't deteriorate. But our arrangements were often just really stupid. You know, like in the first verse, we do four shots. And in the next verse, we'd make it seven shots and we'd have to remember all this stuff, but it, it didn't really <laughs> matter, you know, but we were tight and the music was interesting and adventurous. So I'm not knocking it. I'm just saying. <laughs> oh, great. It was fantastic. Uh, I remember that performance and I remember thinking I'm, years later, I mean, when I looked at it the other night to, uh, as I was going through some stuff for this interview, uh, I saw it and I'm thinking to myself, you can't, you couldn't get away with doing that kind of thing on television now. Like much music wouldn't be able to do a Daytona beach on live on the beach kind of thing. You, that must've been a great, great like weekend or whatever it was. It was a lot of fun. I remember I got really sunburned. Um, <laughs> uh, I also remember Kim Mitchell was there, which we were all excited about. We were quite young and, 
and big, um, big fans and of Max Webster and Kim Mitchell. And we actually covered one of their songs in, in our shows called, uh, um, oh, it goes, no matches, no cigarettes. Do you know the one I mean? Dun, 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 dun. I know the tune, yeah, I can't remember. I'll remember. <laughs> Toronto Tontos, that's what it's called. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so my class so Kim, Mitchell, that was the Kim Mitchell was there and he said to us after our set, he goes, wow, I thought you guys would be kind of jokey, but you're actually all really good musicians. <laughs> and that was a real huge, uh, you know, compliment. And on the flight home, I sat beside Denise Donlin on the plane. Mm -hmm. And I was just sort of finding my way in the music business. I was still like, I joined the look people when I was in high school. You know, I was, I was skipping classes to drive to London, Ontario to play at Call the Office and sitting beside Denise Donlan, who was really cool and really nice. And I remember her just asking me what kind of music I was into and what I wanted to do uh, with my career. And just one of those people you meet along the way that, that makes you feel comfortable and, and makes, uh, reassures you that you're, you're going in a valid direction. <laughs> That's a great... <laughs> That's great. Um, I'm not sure how you find the time to do everything that you do. When, when you look back on your body of work, um, you've got the solo stuff, uh, the stuff with Thin Buckle, um, the cousins, um, Bare Naked Ladies. How do you balance everything out uh, time-wise? I mean, is Bare Naked Ladies kind of the main focus and then everything else gets scheduled around that? or uh, Pretty much. Uh, Bare Naked Ladies is you know, I, I don't mean this in a negative sense, but it's my job, you know, and it's, it's, that's the commitment that comes first, because that is the thing that has given me a way of life that I can support my family and support my career and support my other creative endeavors. Gives you the opportunity to do the other things. Yeah. But to me, collaboration is very important and learning um, from other people and not remaining in a, a static creative dynamic, if you know what I mean. Yep. And so each of those things offers something different for me. And of, certainly with Harland, he's my cousin and we've been best friends for a long time. Uh, we shared an apartment when we were both starting out. Uh, the Rio Statics I've been playing with since before I was in Bare Naked Ladies. Um, so these are kind of relationships and, and certainly Thin Buckle is made up at the core of the rhythm section from the look people, Chris Gartner and Bob Scott. So they're relationships that continue through the years for me and I'm very dedicated to them and uh, they're all important to me. And I, I do love and, and enjoy the Bare Naked Ladies as well. Mm -hmm. Um, you joined Bare Naked Ladies in, I think, 95, 94, 95. Um, when you joined, you were there uh, essentially for the touring aspect of it. Did you know at that time that you were going to be a full-time member of the band, or was it kind of a long audition? <laughs> you know, that I, um, I was contacted by the band, and they said, we don't really want to do auditions. We are hoping you will come and do a two month tour with us. Mm -hmm. And without saying it, I think that was my audition mm -hmm. because I think musically they'd seen me play. They'd seen me, they were big fans of the Rio Statics who I was playing with. Uh, they were big fans of Corky and the Juice Pigs who- uh, It was I, by the way, they were fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I was playing with them as well. So they knew, they knew me and but I think they wanted to see how I functioned within the context of, you know, the personality and the humor and traveling. Being in a band is as much as it is about being creative and playing. It's also about, can you have a meal with this person or, you know, um, personalities. Yeah. So I did a two month tour with them. And after that, they asked me to join. Uh, your first record with the band was stunt. Um, after well, my spectacle, I think, was the first. But. Yeah, yeah. My first studio record was Stunt. Um, that album, of course, before that album, you guys were kind of always, Bare Naked Ladies were kind of our band. 
you know, Canada's band. Uh, I remember going to Michigan and meeting up with my cousin and his wife and his cousin, his wife was playing stunt and, and she loved it. And it was this new band, the Bare Naked Ladies. And I was like, well, they're, they're not new, man. And I got so mad and so protective over it. Um, stunt, you, you get yourself a number one song on the, US, on the Billboard charts. Um, how did that change things for you guys? I mean, was, was that a culture shock for you guys to have that kind of sudden fame in the States? He's, I think we lost you, Kevin. Well, I'm going to be a nerd and show the album. You lost me, right? No, I think you're fro. There you are. Scott. We got you. <laughs> we got you back. You there? There you are. Oh, album. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's, that, um, that's body parts from all of us. Oh, really? I never knew that. All the band members mixed together. <laughs> yeah. I, but first of all, that's your question. Um, uh, obviously, the band had overnight fame, sort of, with uh, in Canada. Are we doing okay here, Scott, or am I freezing up on you? Yeah, you seem to be freezing up a little bit. We every okay. time, I think I got you back now, though. You with me? Yeah, if it keeps going, let me know and I'll try to figure out something. Sure. Maybe got a lot. Got a tether... lot. <laughs> yeah, maybe I can tether to my phone or something, but let me know if you want me to try something, okay? Okay, sure. I will. Um, sorry, we were talking okay. about. Yeah. Um, when I joined the band in 95, we were still playing clubs down in the USA. Mm -hmm. And shortly after I joined, the band switched managers and hired Terry McBride and Network. And he was like, you guys have to just keep going down there and building your audience. Mm -hmm. And I think radio stations were hesitant to play the band because some people wrote us off as you know novelty and fun, yeah. but we just kept going back and and every time we go back we'd play a larger venue, and once that started happening, then the radio stations started coming on board, and once that happened, then the, the record company Reprise came on board, and so when we went in the studio to record Stunt, there was a lot of momentum and a lot of excitement and a lot of support from the record company. And I remember Ed brought in the song one week and sort of hunched his shoulders and said, I did this. And I knew, I just knew it was a hit as soon as I heard it. And it was the first song where we'd sort of brought in the improvisational uh, aspect of our live shows onto our record. And um, it was really exciting when that song um, came together and we were shooting a video in Los Angeles with a guy named Mick G who went on to direct uh, some of the Charlie's Angels films <laughs> but I remember he was so excited about the video he's like we're gonna have a plane coming in you guys are gonna be getting chased and jumping over cars and you know it was all very exciting and um, yeah that was the Dukes of Hazard car wasn't it <laughs> it was, yeah, yep. Yeah. And uh, of course, after that, we were playing, you know, the arenas down in down in the United States, and uh, that was really a high high point for the band. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll switch gears a little bit, um, not to get too uh, depressing, but uh, you found out shortly after that album came out um, and the success of that album that you were sick. Um, yeah. Uh, you were diagnosed with leukemia. Mm -hmm. um, what goes through your mind when all of a sudden you've got this massive success and then you find out that kind of devastating news? You know, I, I remember the song went to number one the same week that I was having my bone marrow transplant. Mm -hmm. uh, there, and 
I, I was dying, you know, there was a 70, at the time, a 70% chance of success for the difficult procedure I was going through. Um, I told you I wanted to tell you a story about this photo and it sort of connects, but when we were making stunt, I started losing a lot of weight and um, there's a photo on the inside of the record and you can see I'm missing some hair. They had to shave my head because on the way down for the photo shoot on the plane, someone opened the overhead bin and something fell on my head and, you know, blood started coming out. And so it, and it knocked me out. So I woke up to someone slapping my face, a paramedic, and they, uh, they were like, what's your name? Kevin, what year is it? I said the year. And then they said, who's the president of the United States? And instead of saying Bill Clinton, I accidentally said George Clinton. <laughs> and <laughs> I, heard, I heard Tyler from behind going, yo, that's my man, Kev. <laughs> <laughs> oh so yeah, I was going about this business with the band trying to ignore the fact that I was getting skinnier and the symptoms just started getting worse. You know, I, um, while recording Call and Answer on the record, I was under the piano between takes in pain. Um, and finally, I, I did get tested and they said, I'm lucky I made it home. And I had to get into the hospital right away for a bone marrow transplant. And I said to Dr. Amato, I said, because I was so excited about the album, you know, I was like, when can I get back to work? And he put his hand on my shoulder and said, Kevin, you've got to absorb this now. You might not get back to work. You might, you might die in a few months if you don't deal with this. So uh, he said, I'll never forget. He said, you're too young to be grappling with your mortality. <laughs> and that's what I began began doing, you know, I packed luggage going into the hospital, not sure if I'd be coming back. So the whole thing with the band, the rock and roll dream, all of that, I had to just let it go. And that was difficult, but of course. Yeah, that was sort of the end of an era in my life, for sure, the way I saw everything. Well, um, you received uh, bone marrow from your brother, correct? Yes. I, which is, I mean, I can't even get my sister to let me for records, so. <laughs> yeah, I, I never forget. I, I told all my siblings they had to get tested or if asked them if they would get tested. And my brother, Sean, he had a smoke, he goes, don't worry, Kev, it's going to be me. We're going to get through this. <laughs> and it was him. He's the coolest. <laughs> uh, you released your solo album. Um, with, it was a Thin Buckle record, I, I believe, uh, H-Wing, right after you got better. I mean, a lot of those songs were quite personal. Um, you wrote those while you were in the hospital. That's correct. Yeah. I want to show the cover of H-Wing. Mm -hmm. My mom, oh, my mom knitted the birds on the cover. <laughs> yeah, Scott, I basically wasn't sure if I was gonna leave the hospital and I just started writing. And I thought, you know, maybe these will be the last songs I, I write. And I'd never written songs that way before that really required me to dig deep. And, um, you know, I, I'm pretty, grew up in a pretty comfortable middle-class home, pretty privileged, you know, and this is the first time I think I'd really experienced real pain. And I think it expanded my, my songwriting abilities <laughs> as do a you, bonus. Do you think that having that healing process and writing that album helped you get better? I think so. Yeah, it helped me. It helped me feel good. It helped me express my feelings. 
And it eventually helped me connect with the people who helped me make that, that record, Chris Gartner and then Bob Scott from my old band, The Look People, Martin Tielli from the Rio Statics, uh, Michael Phillip of Voyevoda, and the engineer and who owned the studio, Jeremy Darby, who it turns out had been Lou Reed's sound man for a long time. And he introduced me to Lou Reed. Which I'm going to ask you about, obviously. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, but that's, that's the power of that record in my life. You know, it, it led me to that whole trajectory. So many other things. Um, I'll, I'll mention Lou Reed now since, you, since you've taken us there. You got to tour with Lou um, before he passed away for a few years. You were uh, in a part of his band and his touring band. Um, where you, you, were also, you were his musical director, I believe, for, for that, those years. Um, yeah. What kind of a dream job was that? And, and you answered my question, how did you meet Lou Reed? But uh, um, you met him through that process, through the H-Wing album. <clears throat> Um, I, I'd met him over the phone before, uh, when Bare Naked Ladies would go to the reprise head offices in Los Angeles, we'd always ask Howie Klein for the latest records that weren't out in the stores yet. And I said, Howie, do you have Lou Reed's new record, which was the ecstasy record? And he said, are you a Lou Reed fan? I said, oh, he's my hero. And he was, you know, I had his, um, picture up in my locker all through high school and played all his songs. I knew every single one of them. And he said, well, Lou's a friend of mine. And he picked up the phone and dialed Lou Reed and said, I want you to meet Kevin. And I met Lou over the phone and told him how much I loved his work and how much it had meant to me all through my life. And that would have been enough. But when I got really sick and I was, I remember being in my office and I could barely lift up a phone. I was so weak and I was bald and my assignment, daily assignment was get up and down the stairs once a day. And I remember lying there and hearing a message come on my computer and I looked and it was an email from Lou Reed and it said, hey, Kevin, I hear you're not doing well. I hope you get better soon and get back to your music. And I was so happy and moved by that, that that was the first day I went down the stairs, out the door and walked around the block. And on that walk, I met Chris Gartner, who came back to my house to listen to the songs I'd been writing and said, we got to go into the studio. And he introduced me to Jeremy Darby, who turns out to be Lou's sound man. But by some strange cosmic coincidence and reconnects me with Lou on another channel. And so Lou and I started up a friendship at that point. Sorry, it's a long story. I'm talking a lot, but you know. Oh, good. Okay. I love stories like that. I've heard you should never meet your heroes, but uh, in this case, it worked out quite well. <laughs> yes, he, and he became, uh, he became a very dear friend and mentor and treated me like a son. Um, yeah, I love the guy. <laughs> I miss him. Yeah, that's, that's well, we certainly miss his music too. Um, I want to jump to um, the Big Bang Theory. Um, and I, I'm dying to know how that came about. Uh, who contacts who? Do you guys send a, a song in and say, you know, here's something? Or, or do they come to you and say, we've got this TV show. Would you guys be interested in writing a song for it? I mean, that's got to be the most listened to song with that show in syndication. People hear that song 14 times a day. <laughs> yeah, it's quite amazing. It's kind of like winning the lottery in a way, you know, and not just in a financial sense, but um, what an amazing opportunity for us. We've been approached over the years to do theme songs or songs for shows. And so often you do you do something on spec and they don't use it or they use another band or so we're, we often get a little like, Oh, a little hesitant to jump. And, but I think I'll tell the story as best I can. I, Ed had just read a book about the creation of, or 
the, the universe. And as Ed does, he always raps in the show about things that are going on in his life or are on his mind. And we did a rap that night about the planets and the universe. And it just so happened that the creators of the Big Bang Theory show were in the audience. <laughs> Bill Prady and the other fellow who I should remember his name, but I don't at the moment. Um, I know Bill Prady was there and they said, what you did in the show last night is kind of what we were hoping for, for the theme song. And we were gonna ask you guys to do it. And Ed wrote the theme song in the shower. And I believe we went to phase one, which you mentioned before mm -hmm. and recorded the theme. That's awesome. Um, when, uh, when Stephen Page left uh, in 2009, I believe, um, you got far more involved in the songwriting process. Um, before that, the band kind of had the two main writers. Um, all of a sudden, there's a little bit more space there. Um, do you guys bring, bring your own songs to the table and then sort of go through it as a group or do you work together? I just want to mention, Scott, Chuck Laurie is the guy who I couldn't remember. As soon as you said it, I was like, it's in my head. I just can't. Yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, before Steve left, I did write songs. Um, I did write one for Stunt, that, but I think the idea of me contributing songs was still a little too fresh. And, um, but once I was firmly entrenched in the band, I started writing songs and usually Steve or Ed would, would sing them. Uh, songs like Adrift, The Sound of Your Voice. Um, I did have a song on Maroon called Hidden Sun. But once Steve left, I was, I was invited um, to sing the ones I wrote. And that was a cool development. And to answer your question, yeah, we, when we know we're gonna make a record, we all sort of send each other a, a folder of the songs we're working on. And then work on them together. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I'm here, right here in my living room, or in Jim's, Jim's living room. Um, the Canadian uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2018, um, obviously the biggest honor that any Canadian musician can get. Um, you got to perform on uh, on the Junos, and it was bringing Stephen back, um, and Andy Cregan came back as well for that performance. Um, I said, if we have Steve, I said, Scott, if we have Steve, we got to have Andy. Well, it makes sense. I mean, Andy yeah. was a big part of the beginning of the band, right? Absolutely. Big shoes to fill for me. He's an amazing musician. Um, the He's gone on to do stuff as well. I mean, he's done a lot of solo stuff and, and things like that. I think he did. What, did he do some teaching, I believe? He's doing teaching. Um, he studied ar arranging. And when Bare Naked Ladies has performed with orchestras, he often does the arrangements. Oh. So we still work with him sometimes. That's good. And Jim still works with them. They do the Cregan Brothers thing, right? The Cregan Bros, yeah. That's good. Um, you, I believe you've performed with, or kept in contact anyway with Stephen over the years. Um, was it awkward that night or that week leading up to it to have all of you kind of back together? Uh, obviously it was uh, emotional and, and different for each of us because we each had our own relationship with Steve as well as our group relationship with Steve. But we went in deciding that we were going to embrace the evening, put those things aside and enjoy the evening because we all, we all felt connected to it as a group and including Steve. So we put that aside for the evening and it was harmonious. Um, did you leave thinking that was fun now back to Bare Naked Ladies as they are now? Or is, has there been any kind of, you know, door left open for, for any kind of reunion in the future with Steve? 
or are you working with Stephen directly? Well, I'd say never say never, but you know, we're pretty focused and happy with where we are right now. And I, I think Steve is too. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, I, I mentioned about Lou Reed. You, you guys have also worked with Kim Mitchell. Um, you've worked with Sarah McLaughlin. Uh, I absolutely loved the, uh, the work that you wrote with Carol Pope, um, The Resistant. Oh. Uh, that was a phenomenal song. That project must have been great to work with. I met Carol a long, long time ago um, down the road, and she's, she's just a wonderful, wonderful person, great musician. How did that come about? Carol's one of the coolest people. I'm, I'm honored to be her friend. Uh, shortly after Lou Reed died, I was approached by Ron Skinner from the CBC who asked if I would um, direct a celebration show for Lou Reed, um, which would be a, a CBC presentation and filmed as a concert at the Glenn Gould Theater. And so I began making a list of people who should be on the show. And of course, Carol Pope came to mind. And that's the first time I worked with her. She did a version of I'm Waiting for My Man. And we just sort of hit it off and felt comfortable around each other. And uh, she said, we should do some more stuff. And so uh, the next time was in Los Angeles. She happened to be around while I was recording with my cousin, Harland Williams. And she came to the studio and recorded some ad lib stuff with Harland. And uh, as I got more comfortable with her, I, I was working on a song and I just had a melody and a piano part, chord progressions. And I said, Carol, I had an idea, do you want me to send it to you? And she said, yes, please. And uh, she sent it back with her lyrics and um, vocal for Resist It. And I was like, oh, okay, we're going here with this song. <laughs> All right, <laughs> quite political, but cool, I love for, it. For, for you, I mean, anything that I had ever heard from you hadn't quite touched that ground yet, so. Uh, no, you're right. Um, if it did, it was usually very subtle. But yeah. this was really like was in your face. <laughs> yeah. Man, I loved it. It felt good. Um, I'm going to just ask you a quick, just to wrap things up, I'm going to throw some, uh, some quick questions out there, some rapid fire questions. Okay. Um, the, uh, first of all, I mentioned the cousins. You've mentioned Har Harlan Williams a few times. For those of you, uh, for those of our members who may not know, which I doubt, uh, Harlan, and, and I'll be honest with you, I didn't know until you started doing the cousins records that you were actually really cousins. I had no clue. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Harlan um, Williams is a, is a comedian and an actor. People would know him from uh, Half Baked, Dumb and Dumber, uh, something about Mary. Um, is that, I mean, it's funny stuff, but it's also good i mean i would never in a million years have even had even known that harlan williams was was a good singer or a good musician <laughs> he's a great singer he is he really is he's got yeah. a great voice. it's funny because he wanted to make a real like rock and roll record he wanted to be a musician and i wanted you know i want to do some funny stuff because you're hilarious and so we sort of met halfway and it's kind of like ween or something to me yeah. <laughs> that does remind me a lot of that to be honest yeah so it's seriously done but there's really funny moments i think um what's your favorite bare naked ladies album that you've appeared on if you have a favorite uh gosh i i really like um i like fake nudes a lot mm -hmm. which is our last record just i I, I felt like uh, everyone brought good stuff to the table and sort of started becoming a band I, I felt we could be, you know. Um, Canada Dry turns into a song that 20, 30, 40 years from now, we're gonna, it's still gonna be sort of one of those songs that become a part of Canada, you know what I mean? Like I can see uh, every Canada day for the rest of time, you're gonna hear Canada Dry. <laughs> I always love the moment where he sings uh, about Gord, you know, because we lost Gord Downey and uh, um, 
Yeah, whenever we sing that line, I touch my heart because I I'm think of them. That's good. Um, is it true, and I, and I ask this because part of it frightens me, but is it true that you guys record one song off of every record completely nude? <laughs> and why? <laughs> I, got a, I got a photo for you, okay? Oh, Don't be know. scared. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, we used to. We used to do it because it, it would just be silly energy, you know? And if we had a really upbeat song, like for instance, on, on Stunt, the song Alcohol, we recorded naked. It just make us laugh and be silly and put that energy into the, the music. Uh, I guess as we got older, it stopped making us laugh. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just like oh we're naked again damn okay so we don't really do it anymore but we did do it traditionally for a long time um i'm sure you've been writing and keeping busy and doing all those things you've probably got a lot a lot of ideas in your head um when things get back to normal um whatever our no new normal is going to be but when things do get back to normal what's the first thing that that kevin hearn's doing is it is it getting together with Bare Naked Ladies uh, to do some stuff? Is it a solo thing? Uh, I've been working on a few projects I'd like to put out there eventually, but the Bare Naked Ladies, we have a new record as well. So I think once things get back to normal, whatever that is, I think we'll, we'll first thing is wanna get out and play and play the new songs and connect with our fans and and get back to work, so to speak. <laughs> and, and it's going to be weird. Like you said at the very, very beginning, it's going to be very strange to, to get on a stage again and have people close to you. Yeah. And what about the audience? Is the energy going to be greater because people are going to appreciate what they're experiencing on a, on a deeper level? I, I think so. I hope so. I agree with you. I think it will be. I think people are going to be so happy to be sharing that again and, and, and be around other people and be able to experience that. I think it's going to be fantastic for the audience and for you guys. Did you see any of the Tragically Hips final shows? I didn't. I wasn't lucky enough to go see any of them. I obviously saw the one on TV. I know an awful lot of people who, who uh, did travel and go see them. I wish to God I was in Kingston for that final show. That would have been fantastic. But I've seen them so many times over the years, but not that one. I saw one of their final shows in Toronto and I've never experienced energy at a show like that. And the power of the music and the power of it, what it meant to people was so strong. And as we were talking about a minute ago, like I think we could experience a difference in the end it shows. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. I agree with you. Um, I want to thank you so much for being with us. It, it was an absolute thrill to talk to you today. Um, it's been great uh, going through the, the career of the Bare Naked Ladies and your stuff as well. Um, I hope you and your family stay well. And I really, really appreciate you being with us here on The Record Player, Kevin. Thank you so much. You too, Scott. Sorry if I blathered on too much, but you know, you were asking questions. So. <laughs> is this, this is the only time in my life that I don't get to blather on. My wife gets to hear somebody else talk. So. <laughs> okay, next time it's your turn, okay? <laughs> Thank you so much, Kevin. I appreciate it. Bye. Take care. <laughs>